thanks for coming. I'm Emily, uh, and you know all the things about me already. So thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, we're here to hear about uh, the artist practices of uh, Jasmine Johnson and Rachel Pym, who are here all the way from the UK, and we're really happy to have them. Um, and they're here because of uh, the museum's relationship with Rabbit Island. So that relationship started in 2012 um, with the commencement of the artist residency program in the first artist in residence, Andrew Ranville. No D. Uh, Andrew is um, here tonight. He's a co-founder of the islands um, and the director of the islands. And he's going to um, introduce Jasmine and Rachel. Andrew also is a new resident to the UP. He has a space in Calumet, which he just opened up, which is called Make Work, Do Good. No, do Work, Make Good. Do Work, Make Good. Uh, <laughs> so stop by and see it the next time you're in Calumet. Andrew, take it away. Thanks, Emily. Um, I just want to start and say, just say thank you to Emily and to former director Melissa as well and the DeVos and the, also the department here, Art and Design Department in Northern for continuing the partnership that we have. It's a really in great way to kind of, to show, you know, the island experience and the work that comes out of, comes out of it. It's a, it's really important to have a mainland kind of resource and partner to communicate like kind of all the amazing discoveries and work that kind of happens out there. So hopefully we can continue that relationship and uh, have more uh, events like this in the future. So I'll just really quickly um, turn it over to Jasmine and Rachel, but I'll just give, I'll uh, get their, their, their kudos out of the way because they're amazing artists all the way from London. And the residency, to become a resident at Rabbit Island, it's a pretty uh, tough process. I mean, it's a pretty demanding selection committee process um, for the, co the committee members and also for the artists that get chosen. So we've had, to date, uh, Exactly, we say like approximately a thousand, but I can tell you it's 997 applications from the open call, and we've awarded a total of 26 uh, uh, supported residencies. So they're in uh, some really amazing uh, class of artists. If you consider like how many, I think 37 different countries uh, have been represented in the applications as well. So uh, these two artists are one of 26 out of that 997 who have applied to come to Rabbit Island and make work there and live and work on the island. Um, and the island itself is this, uh, I'm sure most people here know about it, but it's um, 91 acres, about four miles off the east of the Keweenaw Peninsula. Uh, it's got a, a conservation easement on it, so it's protected in perpetuity. And we thought, like, you know, what's the, the kind of highest calling for this really beautiful natural space? And it's to uh, really challenge and celebrate the creation of culture, given a lot of these uh, issues of how we interact and um, have a creative practice in, in a sensitive ecological area. So um, I'm really honored to be able to uh, see these artists again after a year and look forward to hearing about their collaborative practices and their independent practices and how that has kind of informed how they end up coming to the island. So uh, Jasmine, uh, she is uh, born in Brighton in, but lives in London, been in London for a while. Um, both of them are based in London. Uh, and Jasmine works in video drawing, installation, and performance to produce increasingly ambitious portraits of globally dispersed individuals, objects, and activities. She has her MFA from, the, uh, from Goldsmiths, University of London, and a BA from Fine Art from Nottingham Trent University, where she also is now a lecturer. Rachel uh, lives in London as well. She works in sculpture, video, performance, um, and she makes work exploring environments and their materialities, histories, and politics, often from the point of view of non-human agents, such as plants, minerals, worms, water, gravity, or rubber. She has her MFA from the Goldsmiths as well, and was the founder of the London project space Auto Italia, and lectures in fine art at Camberwell College of Art and Arts University Bournemouth. So please welcome, warmly welcome these two artists uh, to give their presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really nice. It's felt like this is your life. Born in Brighton. I don't know. I've never had that before. So, um, yeah, no, it's such an honor to be here. It's been 
an extraordinary experience both last year and coming back again this year feeling like we know the upper peninsula of Michigan now like this is very unusual for English people so um, yeah so we um, wanted to talk a little bit about each of our um, respective practices first to contextualize how we came to make the piece of work that's now on show at the DeVos in the gallery there um, and then we, we wanted to show the video and then pick out some of the themes um, and talk about it a little bit as well um, and Rachel's going to go first. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So thank thank you again. Um, this is my name. Okay. So um, I wanted to talk to you about two kind of specific bodies of work, um, which probably best sort of illustrate how what my approach is. Um, the first is a project called Resistant Materials. Um, and now I tend to focus on in my work on one kind of material at a time, and I'm really interested in natural resources and the kind of the, the point at which they are thought of as natural and the point at which they become something more entangled with, with human culture. Um, so I write about and I document and I research where things come from in the ground in geographies and I study the processes of transformation that these things go through. So what you can see here is an image of an install of a work called Resistant Materials and it's a body of work understanding uh, clay mining and the production specifically of tiles um, in, uh, in Holland. And um, so, what, so in this work, you can see uh, a billboard image, which is a photograph of a, a kind of a skip outside the tile firm, which shows all of the different tiles which didn't quite make the cut. Uh, they have some kind of imperfection, and they are not saleable. And the image is deliberately set up kind of like a landscape with a sky and a ground. And part of the reason for that is the way in which I like to think about the strata and the kind of um, a set of analogies that is about geography and returning things to the ground. And you can see on a series of shelves next to, um, next to this billboard, some of my own kind of like bootleg versions um, of, of the tiles that are manufactured. They're designed to go around corners. That's the kind of USP of this design firm in Holland is that you could tile the world, which becomes this interesting analogy for kind of taking the soil out of the ground and then weirdly resurfacing it. Like, what is that? Um, and what is that relationship to building? Taking something, working with it, and kind of putting it back on top of the old thing. So there's this layering. And the bootleg tiles that I made are, again, kind of in indicative of my usual approach, which is to try and understand the material also by producing things with it. And what that does is it gives me the opportunity to kind of learn from the material and think of the material as a kind of co-collaborator. Um, so it has its own inherent, inherent properties, and they kind of teach me how, how, they, how it works. Um, so through the process of making something, I find out what the limitations are, and that material acts back on me in the same way as I might act on it. Um, now I have an excerpt of a video that would accompany this. Um, which is shot in the in the factory, and I hope I can switch seamlessly between this. How is it going? <laughs> Not quite. Mm -mm. Oh, that's okay. okay. This is classic. Sorry. And the soundtrack is kind of really important in, in the work as well. I tend to take recordings from, from places and then remix them.
video is kind of new. So. Okay, so um, another project, uh, an another kind of... Um, this piece of work is um, a video about rubber. It's called India Rubber. Um, and it was shot in um, all around different parts of India um, in about six different states following various, again, various kind of manufacturing processes. Probably the best way to show you this is also to just oh, skip can through. Can I? How do I get to it? Yeah. OK. Um, and the soundtrack was made in collaboration with a really interesting musician called Graham Cunnington, who is part of a band called Test Department, who formed in uh, about 83, 84. And they... Basically, they worked in and around decommissioned mining sites in the UK, um, and they would go in, and when industry kind of left certain buildings, they would go in and play the building or play the objects within the building. And they became a kind of protest band that went alongside the striking uh, mining movements in the UK. Um, so their, song, their, their songs, their music, their kind of industrial music becomes this protest sound. And I've given him the raw footage. Um, and he's worked with me to make a soundtrack for this. That's not right, sorry. That's another film. <laughs> it's playing the old video still. I can't work with this too screen. Sorry, everybody. Sorry, you're both still filming the same. Shall I just Sorry. do it? <laughs> I'll just do it. I'll just use this, yeah. I mean, no, no. Exactly. Sorry, we put the videos in, but we couldn't skip through them, and skipping through them seems to be the most important part. Okay, so it's um, the video is 17 minutes long.
So, um, yeah, so when I show that video, I tend to show it alongside a sculpture, which is um, a cast in rubber of the original rubber tree that's housed in Kew Gardens. And the plant itself was uh, stolen from uh, Brazil and uh, cultivated in Kew Gardens alongside a whole range of other kind of seeds collected during the Victorian era. Um, and then that plant is cloned and is a monoculture that's farmed across that part of Asia. Uh, so the idea of the replica or the clone is kind of picked up in, and also the like continuing remaking of this sort of rubber substance. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my approach to materials and how I think through the stories. And the next thing I'm working on at the moment um, is, is that going to work? Yeah, is um, a commission with Cambridge University uh, Genetics Lab um, to study the way patterns form in nature um, using the... Um, basically using the paper that Alan Turing wrote in, um, in 1952 called The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis. Um, and I'm trying to understand um, how similar patterns form across kind of all natural forms. So that's what I'm working on next. <laughs> okay. Hello. Um, I just wanted to talk about one project um, which I've been working on for about a year and a half. Um, and it came out of a kind of a crisis where I kind of life came to a halt, everything went nuts. Um, all around me, um, my friends were uh, seeming to kind of um, struggle with what we all termed uh, bothemia, wanting both. So wanting um, to live. Uh, in wanting to be um, sheltered and have a nice secure life, maybe have kids, maybe settle down, but also wanting to have like a wild life. And this was like this kind of like queer conundrum that we were all just like identifying and saying, we, we, how do we do our lives? Um, so up until that point, I'd been making films um, where I'd kind of take, a, take a, a kind of anthropological approach where I'd kind of go somewhere in the world and find someone and they, that person would tell me something about their place in the world. Um, and it would be an interesting way of like networking different experiences. Um, but then I wanted, uh, at this crisis, I was like, I just, just felt like, fuck art. I just, I just, I don't want to do it. I was like, I just want to talk to people who are like, I want to just be real and like reflect the experiences that are actually happening around me. So I started recording conversations with friends about um, dating and sex and um, polyamory um, and <clears throat> those interviews um, and conversations and dates became um, the basis for an audio script. So I, I edited together these conversations. Um, and um, I wanted to use this technique called verbatim theater, which is where you get actors to listen to an audio source and then they repeat what they, what they hear one beat later. Um, and it creates this kind of weird um, effect where um, you're more focusing on the intonation of speech than the kind of content, and it starts to draw out this kind of musicality in speech. Um, so I want. So this is a video that was made last November at the Barbican Centre, and um, it's really poor documentation, but it's kind of. <laughs> I like I, I I keep showing it because it's the best you know way of capturing like the energy of what I think was quite an important point for me, and it was it was the first thing I made after Rabbit Island actually. Um, so, I'll just press play. Uh, it's about a five, four minute clip. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> also, the other thing that she said, which I knew already, is that a lot of people who are in my position, well, she, she's dating a lot of people, basically. She's kind of spun herself this crazy web. Ugh! <laughs> I hate it. I'm just doing it now as like a social experiment, just to see. I'm just trying to like, push it now and like wind up as many people as possible yes and i enjoy doing it i do i'm just really sarcastic and horrible to everybody and some people think i'm being genuine and some people don't and i make vague plans with people and then i cancel them at the last minute that's great <laughs> um hang on a minute it's i don't understand that at all i was like ha 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 but shit <laughs> you're not included in this what because I like you and you're interesting and nice and you're not a dick. Um, 
when we went out, he had really long fingernails. He said that his sister usually fouls his nails for him, but she's I mean, away, so... Oh my god, that's fantastic. That's like the worst thing you could possibly say on a date. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> He's got his sister's name, like, tattooed on his arm, which is, like, fine. But he has many sisters. He likes just the one to <laughs> <tattoo. laughs> <laughs> 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 My sister usually finds my nails. <laughs> no, I still want to get married. The problem is with me is that, well, most of the conflict isn't there. Unstable childhoods, unhappy marriages between our parents. No sense of sort of solid family, nothing solid to go home to, no sense of... So we want that, we crave that, right, in relationships, but we're looking for somebody who can be that stable, give that stable environment that... But there's a big part of us that sort of like rejects it at the same time, where it's like, well, I, I don't know, there's a, this expansiveness to tell. Like, wanna... I want to experience everything, I want to do everything. So I guess when we don't have any models, there's like, there's no rule book, but you know, it's not like, you watch other people's family and then how they play out and think, oh. I don't, I don't have that, maybe that's what I want, because that looks nice. So you kind of aspire to that. But if there aren't many rules set for you, you don't want to follow me either. Okay. <clears throat> okay. 
<clears throat> so, yeah, so that was um, like a 10 minute performance. Um, and then, um, and that was what I call episode one. Um, and I continued to make episode two and three. Um, episode two was broadcast on a radio station called No Wave. Um, and episode three was presented in a um, gallery in South East London. Um, this is, uh, so we, you know, we, we stepped it up a notch. We got into a recording studio um, and uh, evolved some of the uh, parts of the, s of the text to become more like traditional s songs. Um, uh, and I also, um, so for the opening night at the exhibition space, they did a performance, but then for the remain remaining time of the exhibition, um, I made these kind of plinths to hold um, speakers. So, uh, so you had this kind of surround sound, like kind of community in, in the group, in the room that you could kind of walk in and amongst. Um, and I'll play a bit of the, the, the more uh, song-like um, work that kind of evolved out of the one you just saw. Um, so yeah, so here's um, like a, a chair, um, kind of chopped together using a jigsaw. Um, this is a drawing. Um, I made six drawings as well, which were kind of portraits of the people who were represented in the script. This one's called Rachel. It's Rachel. Um, uh, this one's called Patrick. And this is the installation, how it looked. Um, and then this is the performers in the space. Um, so this person I met through a dating app and he was, um, he studied anthropology and he was super, he's poly, interested in polyamory and practices polyamory. And he actually went on a date with this person, with his girlfriend, who uh, was, you could see earlier on. And um, part of the script was me asking both, all of them, how the date went. And it didn't go that well, <laughs> but I kept it in the script and they have to keep performing it. Like, <laughs> they have to keep reliving this, like, quite bad date all together and it's turned into a song and it's like so the tension's kind of evaporated but it's yeah they kind of hate me um <laughs> uh yeah and then okay so this is um there's a song called um the day before you came by abba which i highly recommend um and I set a, a conversation to, uh, I kind of borrowed some of the structure from that song and set a conversation to it. Um, and a performance work kind of evol uh, took um, a simple spoken dialogue and, and started to use sounds um, that were part of the narrative to build up into a drum beat and then it turns into a musical song um, as well. So I'm going to play a bit of that. From like, I probably stayed awake until two, and then I woke up again from three, 30 till 4.30, and woke up at eight. But like I'd seen, but annoyingly, because I was like checking when you were looking at WhatsApp, I could see that you'd seen that I'd messaged you saying, is it going well? And you'd seen that, but you hadn't replied, so. And then I didn't see another message till three in the morning. So it's like, you know, all I knew was you telling me it was awkward. And then, so I assumed you'd be coming in like probably about 11 p.m. or something, if it was awkward. Uh-huh. But I was listening to every sound in the building, thinking it was you coming in the door. Okay. And I was like, oh, how's it going? And then I saw you'd seen that at like 11. Yeah. You didn't reply. And then at like one, I was like, I guess you're not coming home. And then you saw that at three and you didn't reply. So I said, oh, 
Oh, I've seen your message. Uh, I guess you're alive. <laughs> Basically. Anyway, I feel a bit annoyed that I've spoken so much, to be honest. But I was listening to every sound in the building, thinking it was you coming in the door. Okay. Assumed you'd be coming in at like probably about 11 pm or something. If it was awkward. But I was listening to every sound in the building. Thinking it was you coming in the door. so much to, to be honest. honest that's a good place to end that <laughs> so I'm quite a neurotic person I think you can tell from the, the uh, script so yeah we're going to talk about us uh, the work at Rabbit Island now yeah so um, this is the first time we've collaborated just the two of us on a piece of work we have we do work as a, a group um, called More Utopia did we say this already or did we just say it earlier today Early yeah, so Very smooth <laughs> and professional. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, we met at Goldsmiths in 2011, um, and we have a group project called More Utopia, which is based on Thomas More's original kind of premise for the book Utopia, and it we we use that to think about community and kind of like a reading group, and also have done various residencies as a group. Um, so we kind of enjoy travelling and thinking and reading together, and we often work for each other on each other's projects. So we have like a really good kind of dialogue between the two of us. Uh, and you can see quite clearly who's the person who's interested in human history and who's the person who's interested in stuff. So for us, the kind of, um, the location of Rabbit Island as a residency space, um, being uh, both the kind of really interesting uh, geological site um, with the copper ridge running through it, but then also um, being a kind of a space which uh, which has a lot of con contested kind of land issues, as with a lot of different places where there's indigenous people uh, and settlers. Um, so we went to the island kind of via a research route, uh, and the island itself, which hosts three monthly residencies each summer, we were lucky enough to be um, one of the artists in residence. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about our experience there. Okay. When we arrived on the island, we were issued with a small bottle of Dr. Bronner. This was to use very sparingly for clothes, dishes and bodies. We were shown where the regularly migrating long drop is and advised about how much toilet paper to use and where to find good composting leaves to flush the toilet. Washing consists of uh, the daily sauna, which is very luxurious, followed by a jump into the hot tub, which is 
Lake Superior. Um, conveniently located, it was basically a rock and pool. Um, <laughs> there are con two constructions on the island. One is the kitchen. Um, studio, kitchen, deck, with, it's just, yeah, this beautiful construction here. Um, and the other is the sauna, which is a kind of a five minute walk away. Um, we became more aligned with the environment as we learnt to the trail between the two structures. Optimum distances between steps, cracks, loose rocks, roots, wrapping themselves at right, at right angles around roll, <laughs> vole and snake holes, which were bordered with ancient ferns and mosses, which if stepped on would never recover. Okay, so um, even though we were very briefly inhabiting what was termed as the wild, we brought with us and we continue to remain suspicious about the use of the word nature um, and this sort of pristine representation of something that's separate and other than ourselves, preferring to think about the term ecology and the entanglement that we have with our surroundings. And some of these surroundings might be environments as diverse as landfill or scrapyards or the crook of an elbow or the inside of a gut or species and organic matter like bacteria and people and minerals and plants. So some of the kind of thought processes that we, uh, that we brought to the residency um, and reading included stuff that we were part of a discourse of in London, which included new materialism, um, ecology, queer and feminist theory, to name a few kind of reference points, uh, including Jane Bennett talking about vibrant matter, Noah Yuval Harari talking about the history of sapiens, Timothy Morton talking about ecology without nature, and Donna Haraway talking, talking about string figuring, companion species, and um, everything, everything she talks about, actually. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, we just, I want to mention quickly the conversation that she writes in her companion species manifesto, uh, in which the, her dog, um, she writes to her dog, Kay and Pepper, uh, God bless um, her soul. Um, She's dead. Kay and has died, okay, so uh, one of us, uh, one of the two of them, has a microchip injected under the next skin for identification, the other has a photo ID, California driver's license, one is a product of genetic mixture called purebred, one is a product of a gen genetic mixture called white, and we play a team sport together on the same expropriated native land where Kayan's an ancestors herded merino sheep. Um, so. Yeah, so she's talking about the layers of history, layers of biology, and nature cultures and complexity of being part of the same game of being alive. Um, in every specific location, there is a conflation of histories, economies, mythologies, politics, matter, and movement. For, uh, for Rabbit Island, itself a volcanic remnant of a tectonic shift, these consist as a web of intricately connected links to water, trade routes, national boundaries, and the extraction of resources. Okay, uh, this is a, an install shot from the show just next door in the gallery. Um, I don't know if everybody has actually seen the video or if anybody has seen the video, because we can play it, but um, this shows how it's installed. So it's a projection, and then on the right-hand side on the perpendicular wall is a, a kind of a wall of copper, and the copper is there to reflect and double the image in a kind of deliberately poor quality mirror. And then the we would like to play it. Is that a good? The next part is 11 minutes of video. Would I don't know. Is that okay to play the video? Should we do that? Yeah. Emily? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, if you just play it from here, come on. Unbelievably. Okay. So Practice for me. Three, two, one. Unbelievably, 3,000 years ago, explorers called Minoans from a little island in Europe circumnavigated the globe before accurately setting foot within the copper-rich territory of the Ojibwe tribe, part of which is now known as the US state of Michigan. The sailors were also avid miners and were early adopters of the technology of script. Writing had only recently been invented as a way to store information that was too hard to remember such as taxes, property deeds, and debts. At the same time, in pockets all around the world, there was a new technological development. Copper combined with tin made a much harder material than ever before, called bronze, perfect for coins, art, and weapons. Incredibly, 
our brave explorers went on to excavate countless tons of valuable copper from the Ojibwa territory to ship back to Europe for the Bronze Age, never once losing sight of their goal on the admittedly convoluted route. Unfortunately for us, the Minoans left no trace of their dwellings and settlements in Michigan and the only things they left behind as clues to their presence were coins, pipes and figurines. Notably, there were copper crowns of prehistoric kings, there were tablets depicting Moses handing out the Ten Commandments, and there were copies of the diaries of Noah. Some, somehow, somehow, some, somehow these objects remained intact and undisturbed for the 3,000 years until 1890 when two men, one a local sign painter, the other, a former Secretary of State, began successfully unearthing every single thing, one by one. They found, they found the artefacts under small mounds and amongst the roots of trees in a thrilling series of discoveries. The two men were rewarded handsomely for their good work. Authorities from the government's National Museum doubted the authenticity of the artefacts, but luckily, religious groups from Utah safeguarded and championed them all apart from one, known no. as the New Brew Tablet. This is now sadly degraded beyond recognition. Its, its surface of unfired clay did not weather the conditions of the tool shed of one, Farmer McGrewer, despite somehow withstanding the three millennia buried underground. With very close inspection, traces of early script can be made out. Depending on which way round the tablet is read, the meaning could contain a recipe for the copper alloy, or some kind of story about a bird eating grain. It has been impossible for experts to decipher the exact meaning of the symbols. It does not fully resemble any known language, and many of the characters appear backwards or upside down. The Newbury News, Wednesday, November 20th, 100 years ago, 1896. Two men employed cutting wood, hunting and trapping. A few miles north of Newbury are reported having made a curious find. While digging for mink under the upturned root of a cedar tree, they came upon what they supposed to be the petrified remains of three persons. Since then we've examined more closely into the matter, and find that the discovery is likely to turn out to be of great historical value and importance. Along with the images was a stone slab or tablet measuring about 19 by 26. This tablet is divided into 140 spaces, by lines cut into the stone. In each of the spaces is a letter or character. Some of the characters are very much like letters of the Greek alphabet. Others resemble Egyptian hieroglyphics. What the inscription is, no one here can make out, but the tablet has been photographed and copies will be sent to experts for translation. The images as well as the tablet are now on exhibition in Newbury and their owners are taking the curiosity of the people to advantage and charging an admission fee which has already brought them a considerable sum. The tablet no doubt contains the key to the mystery, and until that is deciphered, only wild guesses can be made.
Okay, I'm ready. I'm sorry about that. Okay, that's all <laughs> right. crashed. It's your time. I, I'm <laughs> here all day. <laughs> <laughs> so this, so this is what's left of the tablet. It is, it is sandstone with a with a uh, clay matrix put on, mm -hmm. and then the figures were impressed into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, am I right in thinking there are some different interpretations of what this might actually read? Correct. How one, it might read? one of them, one interpretation was that it was a map to the different copper mines around. You know, a, 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 a read, you know, a map that you'd read. Mm -hmm. Uh, one is that it was a, a votive to the gods, thanking them for the copper. So if that was the original photograph, it was never Correct. photographed flat on, I and mean, it's just been enhanced? Correct. Okay. Sorry, you might have covered this, but how did it get from looking like this to looking... I mean, you said that it's been, you know, damaged and vandalized. It was vandalized. When, when was this image taken? Because that is so clear, or has that been the, digitally reproduced? You know, I don't, I don't know if this is actually... Is that just a drawing that someone's made of what it used to look like? I presume it's. it's a, I mean, really, this this is this isn't this. This isn't this. Um, well, so that's a different image. That's that a different image. Yeah, I don't know where she got that. It looks like a pen drawing. Don't yeah, you know, same thing, something like that. There's some little photocopies down behind you still that we could. Yes. Yeah. No, I'll, here. I'll, you think it's not I'll worth get, us taking? I'll get you real. <laughs> we can get you, we can actually get you a copy of this. Oh yeah. So we just put that right there. Nazi, heart. So to just go really briefly back to the picture of the install, um, so you can see now that we, so alongside these kind of symbols and icons that recur throughout the film, and as well as the kind of subtitles that we deliberately chose a typeface that kind of looks like it's pretending to be some kind of iconography, um, when, you when you look at the picture, you kind of get this duplicated second image. So everything gets to be seen kind of backwards. Um, to think about, of course, which is the authentic object, which thing is real, which thing is correct, which thing is um, bent, basically. Mm -mm. 
Yeah, so we just wanted to touch on um, using a variety of uh, kind of approaches um, or registers in terms of moving image, um, combining um, documentary with fiction and kind of experimental film um, approach, I guess, um, and using different um, types of sound design to enhance those effects. Um, and I think sound design is probably something that we're both becoming quite increasingly obsessive about in both of our individual practices. So, um, um, yeah, we just want to just explain a bit about what, why we've incorporated different uh, techniques, I guess. And, um, and it has to do with the idea of the Newbury tablet as being this kind of carrier of ideas and you can project, it can, it can hold different agendas for different people. Um, so the documentary form um, that exists within the film when we're uh, at the museum speaking to the curator um, about the, the artefacts. Um, and we're thinking about documentary in terms of ethnography or anthropology and about presenting humans in one context to humans in another context um, with as little interpretation as possible. Um, a document is a representation of something. It's about truth and about information and about translating that to another audience. Okay, so the last part of the film, which goes into that sort of uh, badly remixed Detroit um, house music, um, was something to do with thinking about post-structuralist filmmaking and using film as material, um, or at least in that tradition. Um, and we wanted to work with the materials quite close up, think about um, combining these different sets of footage we had. We had GoPro footage from the island, which was that kind of water, splashing water at the beginning, a microscope camera, an iPhone. We were also taking clips from YouTube from these sort of really terribly made documentaries. But And the microscope footage um, at the end, you can see, is the actual notes that we were taking of, of uh, when we were reading the book Sapiens. We were like, mm. this is exciting, it's about mm. script. So we're taking all these notes and then they kind of get fed back in in, in microscope footage, don't they? Yeah, so there's kind of these... Um, these like visual analogies as well that go on between the crystalline structure of the metal when you look through the microscope um, and the markings on the stone and the stones we were seeing on the island and all these ideas of carving um, shapes into things as a carrier of information, like what kind of mark making becomes a carrier for, for what kind of information. Um, and as well, we've been talking about metal as if it's kind of totally independent of other materials. Um, but obviously, metal is kind of an alloy um, and it's already made of various different bodies together, um, and it's been worked on geologically, biologically, uh, by a variety of different agents. Um, and to, yeah, to think again through Jane Bennett um, is to think about ourselves as walking, talking minerals who have kind of got up and had this propensity to move, move our bodies, move ourselves, our skeletons made of calcium, and kind of walk around the world and then move other minerals. So there's this kind of interplay of minerals moving each other. Um, mark making that has potential for so much meaning, a lot of which is hard to unlock. Um, and then fiction, the um, fiction that we create with the script that is uh, read out loud at the beginning where you can hear two voices, our voices, um, reciting um, this story about the Newbury tablet. Um, uh, it's a story that comes from a position of authority, but our, our rendition is maybe a bit off, a bit sloppy. Um, and uh, also the repurposing of the music that um, features in the documentary um, is extremely dramatic, kind of hammy. Yeah, we, uh, it was really good. <laughs> really easy to edit. <laughs> yeah. Add drama where you can't find any. So, um, yeah, fiction is the telling of, imag of an imaginary story for the entertainment or for a message which contain elements that could be coded or decoded and are legible to one community and maybe not to another, like a hidden message from a marginalised group which cannot be decoded by the dominant group. And that's just an idea that um, Levi Strauss talks about extensively. Um, um, okay. And to borrow from Harari, um, who wrote Sapiens, um, he talks about shared fictions with uh, where some fictions... Um, that are told can include the fiction of America or money. And he says, ever since the cognitive revolution, sapiens have been living in a dual reality. On the one hand, the objective reality of 
rivers, trees and lions, and on the other hand, the imagined reality of gods, nations and corporations. As time went by, the imagined reality became ever more powerful, so that the very survival of rivers, trees and lions depends on the grace of imagined entities such as Google and the United States. Um, yeah. Okay, so... <laughs> Thank you uh, very much for having us, and thank you especially to Melissa and and um, <laughs> yeah to, to yourselves and the whole team um, at DeVos, um, Emily for showing us around, and Andrew for inviting us on the residency. Uh, it's been really really amazing to be here. Um, and yeah, if you want to ask any questions or ask us to expand on anything, we can absolutely do that. Um, otherwise, we know an hour is quite a long attention span, so. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. Cheers. Wonderful audience. Wonderful audience. Yes. <laughs> Go on, Andrew. Yeah. How that, I guess I have two questions. So one is basically the, the type of audio that is featured in one of your works has kind of an industrial feeling or some kind of uh, thought that's connected more towards, um, I want to say, mechanical rhythm. You know, mm -hmm. not necessarily in all instances, but either in like human centered speech or mm -hmm. uh, industrial processes. And so I was curious about your experience. Um, the, I mean, the landscape of the island, I think, um, just the sort of extreme heightened sense of awareness of your surroundings that it comes with being in somewhere where, if I, you, if, so it's just the two of us, obviously, so if I walked off to, you know, and with enough distance, then it's you, you're just on your own and it gets kind of quite, I mean, it's a cliche, but it is quite an animal experience, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, that kind of heightening, it happens really rapidly, if I remember. Um, what did you have a? I think that that storm we were in an eye of yeah, a really we epic storm. <laughs> we were at one point like um, streaming a embarrassing TV show. We were watching Orange Is the New Black in the middle of the storm. Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we could have been watching the storm. We <laughs> we yeah. kind of were like watched it for a while, and then we were we were kind of aware, I suppose, of like the sounds of the of the storm, but also of this like weird connected off-grid off experience and using like a solar charger to watch TV in the rain, I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, there were, mo I guess the thing is we, we did, we also tried to record some sound there, um, but we forgot to quite a lot because we were just being there. That's a really, again, a really kind of basic yeah. answer, but um, it's quite a present place. Yeah. But, um, oh, uh, the Immat other Immaterial sound in your work. Um, I mean, I've initially started using sound as a way of um, sort of trying to imagine the space, or like try and put sounds in places where you can't, you wouldn't know what they were. Um, so this idea of like letting materials sort of speak for themselves, um, which for me is a kind of political idea um, in order to change the hierarchies of how important a human might be in any given kind of system. Um, so the sound is almost always actually not connected to the thing itself. Um, there's a kind of indirect route, like you can record things with like contact mics or you can record materials moving across each other. But that's quite, um, that's actually quite disconnected from the stuff itself. 
stuff doesn't always make sound. Mm. Um, but yeah, the materiality of, of how sound is produced and like the waveforms. I mean, I've made a video where I've made the connection between the particular markings of a leaf as a split, split screen video. So on the one side would be a script talking about the, the way the leaf's variegated pattern occurs and what that does, how that photosynthesizes, how that produces energy. Um, but the sound form itself looks like exactly like the pattern of the leaf. So it's almost like the leaf is reading itself as a kind of in a graphic notation. Um, but that's again like at the edges of materiality. There's like I don't you know the stuff that sound is made of is not visual. So there's a translation that goes on. Yeah. We yeah we did speak about that but uh, just earlier but Melissa wasn't there earlier today oh, so yeah. but um, we uh, we both probably would approach a residency in the same way where we'd be immediately like w what we, I mean you just start like going through st you start googling you start going through stuff and we were trying to find we were, we were trying to find something that's like extremely specific. Um, because we were thinking of the island visually as like a very, like a pinprick on a map, and so we were trying to find something almost even more specific and minute than the island to to uh, to extract ideas about the context. Um, I guess that's something we have in common in our work is about extracting context from something. Um, Often it's a p one person um, who performs a particular role or an object that's really interesting connected yeah. to a history. So. Yeah, it was just watching a lot of TV, reading some books, like looking on the internet, and and connections, of course, that had both like a human thing and a geological or geographical thing mm. as well. Um, so it was just a lucky find, I guess. Mm. I just love the way that the two practices meld together and support each other. It's like the materiality is there, and it's but it's the humans that start to get involved. Mm. It's quite messy, yeah. It's like yeah. A, a car, uh, but we use this analogy in the group we work in. We're always like, "How can we crash our cars together?" I'm sorry, <laughs> you're shaking your head. It's, it's, it's terrible. Bad. It was always been a terrible analogy. We've always tried to not use that analogy, but <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But I guess the the fact that it's a hoax and a dodgy um, object makes it harder to navigate as the 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 territory. It becomes much more about narrative. Um, there was, there was, yeah, it was the, ba the battle has actually been to try and make it even remotely understandable as a story because there's yes. about seven parallel possible stories and they all contradict each other. <laughs> so when people are like, what even is it? It's like, oh, it's which yeah. version? Yeah. Where's that? Um, it's in LA. Okay. Los Angeles. Um, but the Dubai Museum, I kind of feel like, is really close. It's the same version of the Dark Days. But yeah. Yeah. It's like, amazing. Yeah. Like the Museum of Geographic Technology has um, rocks. A cigarette butt on display <laughs> that says it was the last cigarette that was smoked by Marilyn Monroe before she died. Oh. Right? Wow. So it's sort of like the, the, his, the history, but the human aspect, and they're writing stories and they're making mm -hmm. history. But Nice. Yeah, it's here over in Los Angeles. Okay. Ever, so we have our UP version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been funny if you get, I mean, maybe even technically you might even have printed this, but like considering the kind of dubious um, truth fullness of it as a historic object, it would have been funny to use the, the credentials of like an established contemporary art museum like if you want to say like, would you loan the, the piece to a we wanted it. We wanted to. Yeah. We. We. Yeah. That was. I think you mentioned today that like they, it's not being digitally scanned. Yeah, I think it's their main draw. So <laughs> that would put put them out of business. How did you ensure that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> what, if, what if you returned to them and it was like intact? 
Yeah, we just oh, stuck it in my tooth. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's been very fun. Thank you.